The Tropical Civilization, Chapter 5 of The Rise and Fall of the Plantation South by Ramondo Laraghi. Even in Virginia and the Caribbean colonies, slavery was a late comer. In the beginning, English colonists exploited their land by means of white servants. In South Carolina and elsewhere, baronies of a feudal type were even organized. The first Africans had arrived in 1619, but for a long time their status was more or less mixed with that of white servants and not well defined. In Virginia, the seigneurial regime was thriving before the problem of slavery made its appearance. But being based on land cultivation and not on anything similar to the Canadian fur trade, it very soon ran into two major stumbling blocks. The first was the conflict with the Indians. Certainly, the Anglo-Saxons never learned how to deal with Indians, as the French did, even if Virginia was not addicted to the wholesale extermination of Indians, as was New England. However, mutual relations need not have become so tense without the question of land ownership. The second problem for the seigneurial regime was the need for a compulsory system of labor. This necessity forever prevented any possibility of good relations, like those established in Canada, between seigneurs and habitants. Slavery, as already noted, was brought to America by capitalism. When the capitalist market began to need more and more of Virginia's tobacco and England entered the very profitable Atlantic slave trade, the English colonies of the near tropical zone were pressed to supply more and more tobacco and to buy more and more slaves, even against their will. Virginia, like Canada, part of seigneurial America, was a member also of a more specific kind of seigneurial civilization that extended from the Chesapeake to Brazil, including the Caribbean and, in part, the Spanish Main. This cultivation was adroitly called by Gilberto Freire tropical, and the distinguished Brazilian writer is certainly right, as its extension covers a tropical and two subtropical areas, reaching as far as the temperate zones. However, it seems more appropriate to use J. R. Mandel's definition of plantation civilizations, so that Canada and both the hacienda civilizations of the Mexican high plateaus and Argentina's large land properties, which presented very similar dimensions, can also be included. Mandel correctly underlines the fact that everywhere the end of slavery did severely shake the hegemony of the plantocracy, but its survival under formally changed circumstances of labor control in several different countries, indicates that juridical ownership of people could be eliminated and yet the essential attributes of the plantation society be retained. Certainly what Mandel calls plantation civilization and what I propose to call seigneurial civilization far exceeded the slave era both in space and time and slave societies appear to be only the tropical species of such civilization. So we come back to Gilberto Freire. Slavery had entered the Americas when both English and French colonists began to establish themselves in the Caribbean. However, as in Canada and Virginia and the Spanish colonies, the early seigneurial system in the islands belonging to both nations was based on white serfdom. The Spaniards, in their first encomiendas, had relied on native labor. Only the physical destruction of the Indians compelled them to introduce black slavery. The transformation of Virginia into a slave colony began when the demand for tobacco skyrocketed in the world market, and similar transformation of the Caribbean islands was caused by another earthquake in international trade, the rise of the sugar era. The decisive way in which sugarcane became established in the New World and the clear possibility of shipping and selling sugar all over Europe made this staple a prize for traders, and the demand for sugar in the capitalist world market went literally to the stars. For whole millennia, cultivated and sophisticated European civilizations had used honey almost exclusively for sweetening. However, in the tropical climate, sugar was easily produced, 
Together with sugar came a boom in other colonial staples, such as tea, cocoa, and coffee. As raw products, they offered to mercantile capitalism the best means of exploiting the new world. Add to this that producing and exporting sugar, as Brazil clearly showed, was all but impossible without massive slave labor, and the circle, or better, the triangle, was closed. More and more sugar meant more and more slaves to be introduced by force into American markets, and if the colonists protested, as Virginians did, to hell with them. So, as previously stated, capitalism forced slavery on America. What capitalists did not suspect, and even if they had suspected it, they would not have bothered to consider the consequences, was that this would invigorate the signorial system of the new world, a society which, in the not-too-distant future, a more mature industrial capitalism would have to reckon with. All over the zone of tropical civilization, set in train by such powerful forces, the seigneurial system prospered. Soon Barbados saw the building of stately houses where planters offered lavish and splendid hospitality to guests. In Jamaica, the governor, Sir Thomas Lynch, boasted a magnificent mansion of 13 rooms with silver services, coaches, and handsome horses a private library filled with books in English, French, Spanish, Italian, and Latin. Another beautiful and well-furnished library was that of Thomas Craddock of Port Royal, Jamaica. In comparison with Massachusetts colonists, whose libraries were filled with Bibles, lives of Cotton Mather, and other edifying books, the West Indian planters showed their humanistic taste for Latin, Italian, and French culture. Their society was strictly hierarchical. Wealthy planters differentiated themselves from average and small planters and from simple freeholders or freemen, not to speak of servants or slaves, in every way. Home, clothes, food. Hierarchy was strictly observed, which is characteristic of pre-capitalist societies, and the ruling class was completely agrarian. By about 1685 in Barbados, all offices, both civilian and military, were in the hands of planters, with an overwhelming prevalence of wealthy planters over the others. Towns were beautiful, but small clusters of offices, residents of large planters, and places for spending money, they were not productive centers. As in Virginia, no noblemen were to be found among the original settlers of the West Indies although they received a not indifferent rejection of pro-Stuart cavaliers during the English Revolutionary Era. But, as in Virginia, English country gentlemen were their ideal models, and in a few decades a complete seigneurial class arose, a class that had built a social structure to rival the tradition-encrusted hierarchy of Old England. Merchants and capitalists made a lot of money in the sugar trade, as did planters, However, they had a seigneurial, not a capitalist, philosophy. Their end was status, power, and the good life, not accumulation. So, they freely indulged in conspicuous consumption, living in a showy fashion. As in other seigneurial civilizations, one of the favorite features of the Caribbean planter's life was exquisite food. The same was true both of Brazil and the Old South which, incidentally, is still today the only section of the United States that can boast an elaborate, distinctive, rich way of cooking. Une civilisation, monsieur, c'est une politesse et une cuisine, said Lamartine, and one might possibly understand more about the old southern civilization by the taste of gumbo, casserole, grits, and barbecue beef, and mint julep, if properly made, than by reading a large number of books. So, West Indian planters dined richly, drank copiously, and entertained lavishly. The same was true of their French counterparts in Martinique and Santo Domingo, and as far as hacendados in the Spanish West Indies were concerned, 
one has only to see the remaining big houses to catch a glimpse of that incredible dead world. However, the West Indian world contained the fatal germs that would kill it. A seigneurial civilization is always strongly dependent on the capitalist world market. Albeit pre-capitalist in structure and anti-bourgeois in shape of mind, it was born inside a world dominated by capitalism, subject to its economic laws, linked to it by something like an umbilical cord. No slave society in modern times could free itself totally from the economic, social, and moral influence of modern capitalism, an omnipresent rival buried deep within its economy and ideology, and simultaneously confronting it from without. The West Indian world was too small to successfully resist capitalist pressure. The first stroke came from navigation laws. Richard S. Dunn and Richard B. Sheridan have observed correctly that Although the glorious revolution saved the planter class from the devastating effects of the Stuart economic policy, it nevertheless left them curbed and on the defensive. They more and more deserted their islands in order to go to London to spend their money peacefully and to defend their interests. There they disappeared as a class and were individually absorbed by new conservative English groups. The unhealthy climate of the West Indies drove away more. The tremendous insurrection of Santo Domingo scared away others, and, in the meantime, delivered the death blow to the French West Indian planter class. During the first decades of the 19th century, the old slave societies of the West Indies were only relics of a dead era. The new industrial bourgeoisie, born of the Industrial Revolution, needed them no more. The era of mercantile capitalism had vanished. What English industries needed now were markets to absorb their tremendous output. Slavery now stood in their way as a stumbling block. It had to be abolished, and it was, even if the debris of the planter class survived it. The case of Brazil was far different from that of the West Indies. The growth of the Brazilian seigneurial society had followed the same steps observed in any similar one. Slavery was introduced in mass in the middle of the 16th century when Brazil first began to supply the greed for sugar of European merchants. So rose the Senhor de Enginho, so similar, as Gilberto Freire observed, to Virginia's, South Carolina's, or the West Indies planters. The so-called Deep South a region where a patriarchal economy created almost the same type of aristocrat and of the big house, almost the same type of slave and of slave quarters as in the north of Brazil. The Brazilian Casa Grande was special in itself. The big house, although associated particularly with the sugar plantation and the patriarchal life of the northeast, is not to be looked upon as exclusively the result of sugar-raising, but rather as the effect of a slaveholding and latifundiary monoculture in general. In the South, it was created by coffee. In the North, by sugar. Throughout the tropical civilization, the Casa Grande unconsciously followed the Brazilian patterns, casting them into the individual style of local cultures. There, the Brazilian planter lived as a patriarch, being to his big family everything short of God, master, mentor, banker, administrator, tyrant, father, frequently in the literal sense of the word. At its best, life there was calm and harmonious, lavish and luxurious, founded on the rhythm of agriculture. The medieval system of open house was usual among Brazilian planters, as well as wasteful economics. Indeed, Brazilian planters lived so luxuriously as to cause foreigners to wonder. They should have wondered, too, had they any chance to check the accounts of such families, which were weighed down with debts. As Caio Prado said, Latifundia, monoculture, and slave labor had, as results, debts. The Brazilian, as well as the Caribbean and Southern economy, was completely dependent on international banks. Linked to capitalism, it was actually dependent on it.
Seigneurial planters, however, always maintained intellectual hegemony. Among the most striking examples in the Old South is that of the Jones family from New England. Of good Puritan origin, once established in Liberty County, Georgia, they quickly acquired a completely southern slaveholding seigneurial mind, and consequently had several members who fought bitterly and valiantly in the Civil War. In the same way, Brazilian planters all but absorbed the Dutch, who remained in Brazil after their defeat. Those Dutch represented, in Brazil, albeit for a short period, the tentative introduction of a system based on industry and trade, against which rural Brazilian patriarchs reacted after the Dutch had been swept away. As in the Caribbean, Brazilian cuisine was sophisticated and rich in Afro-American recipes. Still alive, it boasts such dishes as acara, karuru, tomugonza, and zimzim. It is interesting to note that in Louisiana, the name gumbo comes from the West African word nungombo. Both in colonial and imperial Brazil, the sinhores kept power strictly under their control. Theirs were the most important positions both in the army and in public administration. However, characteristically, their participation in public life increased when, charged with debts, unable to keep abreast of growing industrial prices, their class began to crumble. As in the Old South and in the West Indies, the slave system was wasteful. It exhausted the land, so that it bore within itself the causes of its dissolution. Slavery in Brazil survived the American Civil War. It took a long time to die. When the bourgeois groups who wanted to foster European immigration pushed through anti-slavery laws, immigration began to grow. It now appeared clear how much cheaper it was to exploit wage labor. This gave strong momentum to the abolition movement. Slavery simply could not compete with the new machine age. Curiously, the best example of something similar is to be found very far from Brazil, in South Carolina. There, the big rice dynasties and their great land properties began to crumble after the Civil War. The soft, muddy soil prevented the utilization of machinery. For this reason, rice culture was doomed. Its collapse brought with it the collapse of the old aristocratic planter class. The Carolina Rice Plantation Society of today has no Carolinian in it. The only rice still cultivated in South Carolina is a very small amount, grown mainly to attract ducks. The Spanish-American hacienda, with or without slavery, closely followed the patterns already noted in French-Canadian manners, West Indian plantations, and Brazilian seigneurial properties. The hacienda, wrote Frank Tenenbaum, is not just an agricultural property owned by an individual. The hacienda is a society under private auspices. It is an entire social system and governs the life of those attached to it from the cradle to the grave. It encompasses economics, politics, education, social activities, and industrial development. Everybody familiar with Old South or West Indies plantations will find here striking similarities between the hacienda and the plantation. But on plantations, as on slaveholding haciendas, slaves were far more linked from the cradle to the grave to their masters than peons were to theirs. Tenenbaum even pointed out that the domestic economy of haciendas where everything was manufactured on the property, was the same as on southern plantations of the 18th century. This habit went on, in the Old South, until the downfall of the slave system, as far as common products were concerned. However, the nearness of a great industrial region, and the pressure, both economic and psychological, exerted by such a region upon the South, foretold the death of self-sufficiency. In addition, the worsening colonial status of the South, which more and more put both the marketing and shipping of cotton abroad into the hands of northern bankers, brokers, businessmen, traders, and skippers,
facilitating the sale of northern products in the South, opened the way, in a limited sense, to the introduction of extraneous manufactured goods. The plantation remained, however, a very limited market. The richest planters bought items for their own consumption and coarse clothes for slaves, but foodstuffs and everyday implements, tools, furniture, and garments were still locally produced. How could one forget the homespun, which was the basic fabric for the garments of small southern planters and yeomen, the poor and the blacks, and even planters on routine days? The South, owing to slavery, remained a relatively closed economy, or, better, a complex of closed economies, with a very poor, almost non-existent market. In the Old South, as in the West Indies, Brazil, and Spanish America, urban life was limited. The center of activity was elsewhere, in the big houses, among plantation fields. There the great planters lived, like true seigneurs, frequently even enjoying privileges of a feudal nature, like the Brazilian planters, whose property, by law, could not be expropriated in case of debts. Land was their strength, their life, their philosophy. Southern colonists, wrote C. Van Woodward, established plantations, not cities, and cultivated staples, not trade. The same may be said of both Brazil and Canada, so that the South turned out to be more akin to distant Brazil and far-off Canada than to New England or New York. From its very beginnings, the paternalistic planter class had set precise ideals and aims for its life. Their culture, wrote Gilberto Freire, was characterized more by the desire to enjoy life through the appreciation of a well-cooked fish, a good cigar, fine guitar music, and kindness and tolerance to others, than by the pursuit of material gains, or highly intellectual conquests, that might prove detrimental to a slow and pleasant rhythm of existence. This was, of course, Brazil. However, all over the seigneurial world of the Americas, it was certainly true that this civilization was absolutely free from the Puritan idea of leisure as a sin. Brazilian planters distinguished themselves by lavish, princely hospitality, luxurious garments, tables furnished with silver, the Old South was by no means different. When the revivalist preacher George Whitfield arrived in Charleston, South Carolina, in the first half of the 18th century, he found these people wholly devoted to pleasure, polite entertainment, dancing masters, and the sin of wearing jewels. The old Italian Renaissance tradition had taken very deep root indeed. All this, in fact, came together with an exquisite and refined culture. Writing to a friend, Eliza Lucas Pinckney informed her correspondent that she was able to sing French songs, having taken some pains to keep her French. The same lady used to receive fine clothes from England, sent at great expense. Throughout the colonial Americas, usually considered a wilderness by contemporary Europeans, the planter classes boasted a high standard of sophisticated culture. They spoke French, Italian, and other languages, kept good libraries where Latin and Greek authors were to be found, and sent their children to study in Europe. The plantation, as already stressed, was not only a producing unit, it was far more, a world in itself. When the civilization of the Old South emerged, the Brazilian and West Indian cultures were already old, rich, and opulent, the 18th century's Brazilian planters had already begun to use middlemen for marketing their products. An analogous figure, the so-called factor, arose in the Old South at the beginning of the Cotton Era, but the pattern was the same. In this civilization, members of the seigneurial classes grew paternalistic, arrogant, lazy, slow. However, the basic military character of such a civilization as of any pre-capitalist culture, where the hero has always been the soldier, the warrior, not the moneymaker, came to the fore when they had to fight desperately against heavy odds to drive away from Brazil 
French and English interlopers, Dutch invaders, and fierce Indian nations, and one has only to recall how southern planters rose fiercely to fight the North in the War for Independence. It is, however, very important to underline the fact that Brazilian planters fought capitalist Holland when their seigneurial regime was still in the prime of life, whereas southerners had to fight northern industrial capitalism at the maximum of its tremendous power. Relations other than productive linked masters and slaves. First, a conspicuous number of blacks were removed from productive duties and switched to the unproductive tasks at attending their masters' houses and families. Among these people, it has been demonstrated, a true spirit of caste arose, insulating them from the despised field hands, considered to be inferior, and binding them to a kind of intimacy and solidarity with the family. Truly, they were, in a sense, members of the family. The basic difference between the patriarchal, seigneurial, big family and the cellular, monogamic family of today cannot be stressed enough. Slaves really were members of the family, as in a primitive, tribal organization. One has to go back to biblical times to find something like it. Such aspects of slavery very easily dispose of the absurd pretense that it was a kind of capitalism. Where there is no wage labor, there is no capitalism. Miscegenation was the immediate consequence of such a social organism. For a long time, miscegenation in the southern United States was carefully minimized, avoided, and concealed, even by historians. It existed, nevertheless, as more recent scholars have definitely demonstrated. So, in the late 18th century, seigneurial America was flourishing from Brazil to Canada. However, this civilization was fast nearing sunset. The world by now was not very different from the era of Columbus, Verrazano, even of Raleigh. All over the world, the old ruling classes were being routed by the bourgeoisie. Under the impulse of New England, Great Britain, now under bourgeois rule, had delivered the death blow to La Nouvelle France, the first seigneurial society to be toppled. The consequences were not exactly those looked for by New Englanders. Louisiana went to Spain, later to return, after American independence, to join the other slaveholding states. Canada was not given to the colonists, but kept under royal rule, so that something of the old French civilization might survive. Spain was crumbling and unable to resist the onslaught of other powers. Portugal, since the Methuen Treaty, had become an English colony except in name. Consequently, Latin America's seigneurial societies lay open to English capitalist penetration. No Salvador de Sa was any longer there to repel the intruders. Only in the future would British capitalists be challenged in Latin America by North American capitalists.